You're now recording. Okay. Hello. Um, my name's Martin Ash, and uh, I'm here today to um, turn the tables a bit on, um, on uh, Anthony Peake. So instead of being the usual Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour, this is uh, the Martin Ash Consciousness Hour. Um, I'm the author of the fantasy series Enchantment Reach and Chronicles of the Shaman. And um, I've been friends with Anthony for a few years now, and I've been a great admirer of his work. So I, he's got a new book out. Um, I've got it here called The Hidden Universe, An Investigation into Non-Human Intelligences, which I don't know if you can see that. It's a handsome brute, very nicely designed. And um, it's a, another amazing book, actually, full of um, extremely well um, and very diverse extremely well researched and very diverse um crammed with facts and uh well i think it's absolutely superb so we're going to talk about that quite a lot um before that i want to um just ask him a few other questions about himself and uh, some of some of his other work i oh, also you see, uh, those of you who are tuning in might have been expecting to hear the dulcet tones and uh, view the radiant features of sam constantine uh, stroke treasure, but unfortunately she, was, she wasn't able to make it, so you're going to have to put up with me, I'm afraid. But anyway, um, without further ado, let me introduce um, uh, Anthony Peake. Welcome to Martin Ashley's Consciousness Hour. How are you? Well, Martin, you know, I've been wanting to be on this, this Consciousness Hour for so long, and it is such a wonderful opportunity to talk to you uh, because everybody, Phil and I, just meet quite, on quite a regular basis and we've chatted a lot about Martin. a lot of things. So it's, it's a golden opportunity to fill. Yeah, and it's your, your wonderful opportunity to actually put me under some kind of pressure here, which is really, really good. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to some of the, the left field questions that are kind of been bouncing at me. So nothing, I'm looking forward to it. Nothing particularly left field, but. Um, Quite a lot to talk about, I think. And, Absolutely. Uh, um, I'm very impressed by the new book. I think it's your 11th, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. Lots of stuff to talk about on that, but also other things as well. Um, before we talk about that, though, I thought it'd be interesting to just to get a bit of uh, <coughs> background on, on you because, um, uh, well, it struck me that um, you've, um, you only started writing relatively late in life. Um, so it'd be interesting to know, uh, you know, how were you, what, well, was there anything that's, you know, how were you misspending your youth and your early years before you started to write? And was there, um, was there any particular trigger or event or catalyst that made you suddenly decide to sit down and uh, uh, enter the world of pain that is writing? <laughs> Absolutely, as I've learned to my, um, my cost over the years. Um, I, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to write. It was one of these things that I just knew I was going to do. You know, it's one of the kind of the kind of things you have inside yourself. And I know that most people want to write something. You know, there's the idea everybody says they have a novel inside them, and everybody wants to take the opportunity. Um, and I was no different. Um, but what is I think is particularly peculiar about my own life passage is that um, this the books that I've been writing, I've been preparing for for virtually all of my life. Um, in that probably from the time I was seven or eight, I've been fascinated by altered states of consciousness. I've been fascinated by um, belief systems, consciousness, these kind of things. And I was reading quite extensively at quite an early age on these things. And I think what really stimulated my interest was um, a part series that came out in the late 1960s called Man with Magic, um, which uh, was a Marshall Cavendish part series. And that really, really fascinated me because it, it developed my interest in not just strange phenomena and, and ghosts and, and, and things that go bump in the night and everything else. It also fascinated me because it gave me an interest in um, anthropology. It gave me an interest in sociology. And it gave me um, an understanding of just how wide this field is. Because uh, Mammoth Magic was quite a... Um, an intellectual magazine it wasn't sensationalist in any way at all um and it was like a typical encyclopedia in the sense it was alphabetical and i, I still remember now the very first article i read in it was the abbots abbots bromley and the, the particular events that happened in abbots bromley i think in early january of the year 
But I then had the opportunity when, when I was offered a place at university back in 1973, um, I was in the fortunate position of being able to do a, well, I don't know if it was fortunate in the end, because probably it wasn't because I had to spread myself very thin, but I, I for, my, for my sins, chose to do um, a dual honours degree um, in, in sociology and history. And this gave me an opportunity to focus in on um, particularly uh, the, the religious belief systems um, coming out of the Reformation and the, the religious groups that came from this and the sects that actually developed in Central Europe during that period. And I very much focused in on that. Also, the field I followed up on was Renaissance um, art and particularly the symbolism of Renaissance art. And I was particularly fascinated by the, the influence that Neoplatonism had in terms of the Florentine artists and everything else as well. And the stream underneath there of the mysticism hmm. that that involved. So there was the mysticism taking place in terms of the religious movements of the 16th, 17th centuries in Europe, but also this kind of esoteric belief system from what the 1420s, 1430s and, and the Renaissance. And this, this fascinated me. And indeed the, the way in which art worked and the way in which people seem to create something from something. But on top of this, because I was also doing a degree in sociology as well, I was able to then focus in on the sociology of religion, the sociology of language, the sociology of belief. So I was able to look into in great detail why people believe the things they do and, and why it is that certain spiritual belief systems develop. And in that, I had the opportunity to do a lot of analysis work on the 19th century um, new religions that were coming up. And it gave me an opportunity to look into a little bit about um, Eastern religions and the influence on Eastern religions. And I was particularly interested in, in the development of um, modern day religious groups, such as the Scientologists, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and, and also a lot of the New Age groups that had started off the Ethereum Society and a lot of the groups that came out of UFO ufology as well. So this was the area I, 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 I was keen to, to, to write about. And over the years, I, I, I make extensive notes on everything I read. And because I'm fortunate in that I seem to hold facts in my mind, um, I don't tend, once I read something, I don't tend to forget it. So over the years, I was kind of snatching at books here, there and everywhere. Um, but it was only um, about 1999 that I really decided that I was going to focus in on writing a book because up until then I'd had a comparatively successful career as a management consultant and also as a senior executive in an airline and various other industries, startup organizations, robotics organizations, these kind of things. Um, but I, I had a little bit of money available. I I'd finished a contract um, involved with, with traveling over to Poland, Warsaw and, and, and things and setting up some, um, assisting and setting up some businesses there. And I had sufficient money to take a year out. And I decided to literally do that, literally sit down in front of my lap, in front of my computer and write a book. But at that stage, I had no idea where I was going to go with it. And a year later, um, uh, Is There Life After Death appeared. But at that stage, it was actually called Cheating the Ferryman. So that effectively was, was the start of it all. That's interesting. because So basically, you'd actually, without really fully being aware of it, you'd been preparing... To, to write all your life, just uh, through doing all this with sort of diverse research. Well, well, what I would argue is that if you look into my hypothesis of the Damon Adel the Damon Adelon dyad, and the idea that we have a subliminal consciousness within ourselves that has already lived this life before, um, and that we are living in some form of computer simulation whereby you can live your life multiple times and you can change it like you can do with a third person RPG game, that that my daemon already knew what I needed to know in order to write the book this time round. Maybe last time round, for differing reasons, I didn't succeed. Um, and the daemon was aware of setting the seeds there for me to actually write the book now um, and, and, and everything else. Because one of my major concerns is, and, and you've, you've pointed it out, and it's very, very true, um, I, I was comparatively old as a first time writer, you know, I was, you know, I started writing effectively in my, in my uh, late forties, early fifties. And clearly that wasn't, it's not particularly the right kind of time to be doing it. You want it when you're younger and you're more 
alive, I suppose. I don't know. You know, you've got, you, you know, your brain is sharper and these kind of things. But I found as I've got older, my brain has become sharper. Um, and the timing seems to be right because I think had I written my books earlier, I wouldn't have been able to do what I do now in the terms of networking on, on social media, using, using media like this, because 20, 30 years ago, you can do this. So clearly the timing seemed to be right. Okay, that's interesting. That kind of leads me to my next question, because I was going to ask you. Actually, before I do, I remember Man, Myth and Magic. Um, I think I've still got some copies stashed away somewhere. I'll have to dig them out, but uh, I collected it for quite a while. Yeah. Wow. Um, when you say you can hold facts in, in your mind, would you say you've got an eidetic memory? Because I'm hope well, I'm not hopeless, but, but I don't retain, I, I retain concepts, not, not the minute of facts. So I always have to, when I'm researching or trying to remember something, I have to go and look it up. If something interests me, yes, if something interests me, I can tend to remember it. And it, 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 it borders on the uncanny. And the people who know me well know that this is, it, this is strange um, in that I, it's not just in the things I've read. It's the things I remember from my own autobiography and the things I've done and the places I've been and the people. I remember people's names. I rem for instance, um, we did the launch of this book a couple of days ago, and I met up with two really old friends of mine, people who've known me since I was five or six years of age. And I, I pointed out to, to one of them, you know, the actual, and I wasn't planning to do this, but I remembered the date of birth and the year of his younger sister. And, wow. you know, he looked at me and thought, you know, how the hell do you remember that? And it, I just knew it. It just was there. Wow. Um, and... It sometimes, for instance, with Man, Magic, Myth and Magic is a classic example, and also Knowledge Magazine, which was my also my great generator when I was a kid in terms of, of knowledge and things, is that sometimes I can visualize the page in my mind's eye and find it and read down the page and actually read the, the stuff in my mind's eye. Wow. There's other and there's other times where I won't even know when I remember, where I learned the fact but it just immediately comes into my, my brain. It just appears fully formed. I don't need to seek it out. It just happens. You know, somebody says something and immediately the link is made. Is it an eidetic memory? Probably not. I think as a eidetic memory, you know, it's probably far more powerful. You know, the, the new phenomenon that people are talking about now is superior, superior autobiographical memory. Uh, for instance, there's a young girl in Australia at the moment who remembers everything that's ever happened to her in her life. Um, she's a friend of mine on Facebook, if anyone wants to follow her up as well. It's really interesting wow. stuff. Um, so clearly, to me, we all have this ability. I think our brains contain memories of everything we've experienced. It's just for some reason our everyday brain can't access it. Whereas I argue that demonic consciousness, the alternate consciousness I talk about, can. Hmm. Interesting and um, quite an enviable talent, I have to say. Um, you've sort of preempted me slightly because I was going to ask you about your research because um, it's plain that, you know, from, from all of your books, they're very extensively researched, they're full of uh, really fascinating information. And there's always, as with the new one, The Hidden Universe, there's an extensive bibliography and reference section at the back. So you obviously do read phenomenal amounts. But um, how else do you go about researching books? Obviously, the internet is a very handy tool, but do you travel elsewhere? Do you interview people? Or do you have some kind of um, um, gigantic brain hidden away in a jar in your basement that you just sort of plug into the universe and it collects all the facts and you just go down and print it out one day? What an interesting idea, yes. Yes, the brain of Dorian Gray that's sort yeah. of sitting down, downstairs and I can just access yeah. it occasionally. Um, in answer to that question, all sources, really. Um, I tend to find, again, that because I'm so believing in my concept of the daemon, I literally allow the daemon to just lead me. Because um, sometimes I will not know why I'm following up on something. Like, for instance, the first book. People seem to think that with, che with Cheating the Ferry, which, which now became It Lad or Is the Life After Death, that I started the book with the intention of coming up with the whole cheating the ferryman hypothesis, but that was completely not true. I didn't know where I was going with that book at all. Literally, I had no idea. I had no plan, no outcome or anything, but the book, it's, I use the analysis in a later book that I was rather like Frederick Schliemann when he was looking for Troy. You know, the thing is that Schliemann had an idea because uh, Schliemann was really interested in, in, in archaeology and he knew about the, 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 the Iliad and the, the legend 
of Troy. But people believed it was just a legend, and it was just that. But right. he believed it really happened. And he literally took himself off to Turkey. Um, and he had some kind of vague idea that it might be somewhere in northern Turkey, somewhere near the Dardanelles. And he just started digging in a hillside, the hill of Hisseluk. Um, and he started digging there. And he started uncovering what he was looking for. And suddenly he found more and more as he dug deeper, he found the different levels and the different cities and everything else. And I found that's what I was doing with my first book. I was excavating it. I was, I was like an archaeologist discovering it. And, and suddenly I'd spot something and I'd pick it up. And my daemon would say, run with that. Follow your nose with that one. And suddenly I'd be guided to certain things. I mean, there were so many uncanny incidents whereby incidents in my past had deliberately taken place because I should have got one of the books out actually, because one of those is a classic example of just how curious it was. And I think I can probably show you. Okay. Um, no, it's not coming to me at the moment, unfortunately. I think it's probably because I, I took the book out to show somebody recently. <laughs> I need to find it. But many, many years ago, for instance, I was, I was on holiday in Greece talking about many, many years ago, 20 years ago, pro no more, probably nearly 30 years ago. And one thing I never do is dog ear book, book pages. I never ever dog ear it because I, I hate doing that. It really annoys me. My books are so important to me. Mm. Um, and I was looking up about um, uh, mitochondrial DNA. I was interested in the female line and how mitochondrial DNA within cells worked. And I, when I was following this up, I thought the only person I know that will have written about this is Richard Dawkins. So I went to my, my book collection, which is surrounding me at the moment, and um, I went to Richard Dawkins' book, The, the, the Blind Watchmaker. Yeah. And as I opened the book, I noticed that one of the pages had been dog-eared. And I suddenly, and like a flash, remembered what happened. And I remembered being on the island of Simi in a place called Peddy. And I'd been reading this book and I decided to go up for lunch. And something in me decided to dog ear the page and close it 20 years before. I checked. I then looked. As, as I opened the book, I thought, my God, I know what's going to be on this page. I just knew. My daemon said to me, ah, this is a little bit of proof of how I've been guiding you. I opened the page and it was the page on mitochondrial DNA. I wow. then looked on all these other books. It's the only time he mentions it. So my earlier self is to give me a nice little clue to say, I'm guiding you, did that. And I found that just a kind of a very, very small example of how my books create themselves. Now, for instance, when I finish a book, I write almost in this kind of semi-trance state and I will go off and I will discover things and find things. And Cheating the Ferryman is an incredibly complex hypothesis about life after death mm. or, or life or what happens to the human consciousness before death. And it works. It, it makes logical sense. It's supported by the science. It's supported by even recent science. It's reported by, sorted by the, the work of people like Professor Max Tegmark and his quantum suicide experiment. It's supported by so much quantum physics, so much neurology. But I didn't know that at the time. All mm. I was interested in initially was deja vu and what that was. So it means, and when I finish the books, I'll read them later and I'll, I'll go, did I write that? I don't even remember writing that. And you must know this as, a, as you know, because I'm a great admirer of your work. And I know we've discussed this many times as to where you think your plots are going, because your plots are so incredibly complex. Your characterization <laughs> is amazing. And yet your stories have a beginning and an end and a plot. But you tell me that you, when you start, you've no idea where you're going with them. No, I think it's something that, well, William Blake called it, following the silver string and um, Stephen Harrod Booner, who's a very fine writer as well, a non-fiction writer, turned that into following the golden threads, which I think was something he picked up from a German poet, 20th century poet, I can't remember exactly. But yeah, it's where something, for me, it's something that stands out. I get scenes and I get characters arrive and I have no idea what their story is, but I get the feeling they want to, they want to know. And so I just follow them, I listen to them. And the story comes together and um, 
in a very general, usually a very satisfying way. And there have been times when I've written novels that really didn't work. And that was because I was trying to tell the story. I was trying to force the characters, push them around. People don't like being pushed around, even if they're fictional characters. They don't like it. You have to let them tell their own story. So it's a kind of a similar process, really. That's why it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery, but it's a similar, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, Moving on, and you've just mentioned it in a way, uh, you're referring to, to the daemon, which other, a lot of other people might refer to as the higher self and so forth, as being this uh, ethereal guide. And I know um, central to some, a lot of your work is the idea of eternal recurrence, um, which comes from the Gnostics, I think, originally, and, and Nietzsche picked up on it much later. Um, I was just wondering how, because I find it, I've always leaned towards reincarnation, though there's no evidence, there's no solid evidence for reincarnation, nobody that I'm aware of. I mean, we've had um, instances of uh, past life regression and things, but I don't think there's ever been any solid evidence for somebody coming back and saying, hey, I lived this previous life, this is who I was, and being able to prove it. So even, even reincarnation is something, um, uh, something of a, a mystery or an unknown. But I mean, can, I, I've never been able to quite marry the two, eternal recurrence and, and reincarnation. I can't accept we just have this life and then we die and that's it, because that means life is quite meaningless, really. But can, can, can you, do, do you feel that they are the two uh, mutually exclusive or, or can you marry them in some way? No, far from it. I think that the, they, they are elements of the same thing, because um, in my various books, but particularly um, The Infinite Minefield. Um, and, contri and a contributory chapter I, I, I wrote for a book on pandeism that was published in America a few years ago. I take the argument that there are, there are levels of consciousness, there are depths of consciousness, you know, in, in very much the idea of the Jungian idea of the collective unconscious. And I believe that really my daemon is, is, is a kind of a midway role between the collective unconscious, which, which which has the memory of everything and the individuation of the ego. And it's kind of a, a midway point between the two. Now, if we take that as a logical conclusion, then we have a scenario whereby there is a part of you that exists within the simulation, which is the eternal return or the eternal recurrence, whereby you live the same life over and over again. Or no, you live, you live a similar life. I mean, this is profoundly important. I mean, the whole point, the Nietzschean concept, which he put forward initially, I think it was in the gay science, is the idea that you literally live your, your life again in an identical copy of the previous life. Whereas my uh, concept is far similar to Danny Rubin's concept um, that he puts forward in the movie Groundhog Day. And indeed, the Russian edition, the Russian language edition of my first book is actually called A Groundhog Life, A Chronicle of Your Own Immortality. So what I'm suggesting is that there is some kind of a, a, a field of information that the brain can, can attach into. And that field of information is like a huge database that contains the, the outcome of every alternate decision that you can make in your life. So therefore, when you're living your life again, uh, you, you can you can make different decisions and indeed that is not only to do with your life but it's to do with the fact of the precursors to your life so for instance your parents Martin Ash's parents could have chosen to go and live in Tasmania they could have chosen literally in, in a, a multiple universe if we accept the multiple universe hypothesis of you ever the third every outcome of every decision can be made and indeed this is very much supported by the modern science it's supported by Stephen Hawking and, and uh, Thomas Hertog with their model of called the, to uh, the top-down hypothesis mm. which is the same thing it's the idea is to do with the collapse of the wave function and the fact that any wave function is collapsed in quantum physics any outcome can actually come from that so the idea is that any outcome can take place but any outcome from all your all your ancestors, all the decisions all your ancestors make feed into your world. So logically, your parents could have moved in an, in, a, in an almost infinite universe, could have moved to any country in the world. So you could have been born in any country in the world. And that information field is still there. And those, that life then has so many different outputs and so many different opportunities. In which case, you know, even illnesses you may have get will be different because your environment will be different. So when people turn around to me and say, oh, your hypothesis is terrible because what happens to babies that die 
in the first few weeks of their life. Well, yes, that's in this universe that they die in the first few weeks of their life, but that doesn't mean that that daemon doesn't experience a myriad of other lives that they didn't die at that age because they're in different circumstances. Mm. So it's far more powerful than that. It's far more powerful than just the eternal return, the eternal recurrence. Now moving through to reincarnation. Reincarnation, I think, is if we're all one singular consciousness experiencing itself subjectively, Martin Ash, Anthony Peake, Dia Nunes over there in our producer over in Denver, Colorado, we're all the same entity. We're all the same being. And we've always been the same being. We've been the same consciousness effectively since the first billionth of a trillionth of a second at the Big Bang. Because within quantum physics, there's something called um, a superposition an entanglement whereby subatomic particles, when they're close proximity to each other, become entangled. They share information. They share everything. Now imagine a scenario in the first instance of the Big Bang. We know that everything that is was a point particle, yeah. which was totally entangled. Therefore, as that expands, everything is everything. You know, we think the external world around us is not us. It's all part of us. So therefore, somebody, when they have a past life recall of being, I mean, for instance, I read, I read, wrote a book with Irvin Laszlo a few years ago called The Immortal Mind, and I did a whole chapter on reincarnation. You know, so I went into great detail about the work of people like Ian Stevenson and all the other researchers. And there's a lot of powerful evidence that people can attune into other people's lives, but it doesn't mean it was them. It was them in a kind of a subtle, deeper way, but not their ego. Now, I'd make the final point of why I think that my hypothesis is more dynamic than just a straightforward, simplistic analysis of reincarnation. In reincarnation, you live this life, then you die. You get reborn, you could be reborn in a lower or higher position in society, you could be reborn as any kind of animal. But the important thing is when you're reborn, you don't remember anything about your previous life. It's wiped clean. My argument is, how can that ever be developmental? How can you ever develop if you don't remember your last mistakes? If no part of you can remember the errors you made last time, you cannot learn by them, therefore you cannot progress. So therefore, to me, reincarnation, in its, in its sense that it's is understood, is not, is not evolutionary in any way at all. Whereas cheating the ferryman is, because cheating the ferryman, every time you live the next life, your daemon carries the memories of all your previous lives and uses that information to change this life view, to make you make a different decision, to avoid that decision you made last time, just like Connors does in Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day, he lives the life many, many times. Danny Rubin has been on this show, the guy that wrote Groundhog Day. And he explained to me that in his initial plan, um, Connors was going to live thousands and thousands of lives. And every time he changes it, or it's thousands of days, and every time he changes it. So you're allowed to explore every avenue that you could possibly explore in the final instance of your life. And at the end of that tiny slimmer of time where you can live millions of lives effectively, you then move on because you've become the perfect human being. Just like Connors does, you live the perfect day, you live the perfect life, and you effectively become what Eastern religions would call an avatar. You become somebody who's left the perfect life and you move on. Now, again, this is intriguing because in the play, um, I Have Been Here Before by J.B. Priestley, that you know I wrote a book about rec uh, comparatively recently. In this, there's a character, Gertler, who is somebody who has lived their life many times and has decided and chosen to go back into the simulation to stop other people making decisions and wrong decisions. And I believe you have a choice at the end of your myriad of lives, whether you're going to go back and help others as an avatar within the simulation, or you move on to whatever it is, is the next great thing. So that's my idea. I don't dismiss at all reincarnation, but I think we're confusing what reincarnation really is. So when somebody has a hypnotic regression, I believe they're tuning into what people would call the Akashic field, what Laszlo calls the Akashic field, what yeah. the Theosophists and, and the ancients would call the Akasha, you know, the field of information that everything is built upon. Yeah, absolutely. 
Wow, you've just given me great food for thought. I could actually grill you on that particular topic for the rest of the hour, but I think we need to move on. But that was a very, very detailed answer. Um, before we get to the new book, I just want to take you back to something that really blew my mind in The Infinite Minefield, which was the first one book, book of yours that I read, which is about the nature of light. Now, I'd always... <laughs> Take, I'd always taken the, the view, well, I'd been taught, I suppose, or picked up the, 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 the idea that the, the basic um, particle of light, if you can call it a particle, but for the sake of argument, is, is the photon. And as the photon reaches us, if it hits a solid object, it bounces off that object, hits our eyes, travels in, is transformed into an electromagnetic magnetic impulse, which goes through to the brain, the brain uh, turns it into an image of the world as we perceive it. In the... In the um, in the um, infinite minefield, you totally turn that around by explaining that, well, I'll let you explain it. What, what, what actually happens to the photon when it, when it hits something and then comes to us? Because this is just amazing. Well, the thing is with photons, we, we, we make certain conclusions about photons. Photons are supposedly are a particle or a wave, depending upon, again, whether they are observed or measured. Yeah. But more importantly, that the photon itself is a very, very peculiar thing in that it has, literally, it has literally zero mass, so it has no extension in space. It is literally a point particle. And it's so important to understand what we mean by a point particle in quantum physics. It means that however much you zoom in on it, it will always be a point. It will never actually end up being a sphere or a solid object in any shape or form. So that's the first thing, it has no extension in space, so therefore it has no physicality. The second thing about it is, it can only ever travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, 300,000 kilometers an hour, closely or whatever. That is the only speed it can travel. It cannot accelerate to that speed either, and this is the thing that blew my mind. It cannot accelerate, it doesn't start, and it starts at one mile an hour and super accelerates from one mile to 10 to 100 to 10,000 to, to, to a million miles an hour. It doesn't do that. It can only ever travel at the speed of light. And at the speed of light, from what we know from the teachings of Einstein and what we know from the, 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 the papers that Einstein wrote in, in, in 1905, is that at the speed of light, time and space change. So effectively, space contracts. The nearer you get to the speed of light, space gets, it's called the Lorentz, the Lorentz contraction, and it gets smaller and smaller. So time gets, gets, gets mass gets, le gets more and more, or less and less, and time gets more and more, and the two interface. And it's and Einstein said that they're the same thing, space-time. Space and time are the same things. But yeah. when you get to the speed of light, time stops. So from the point of view of a photon, there is no time. So suddenly we have this tiny object that from its point of view, there is no time. And from its point of view, there is no space because it doesn't have spatial, it doesn't, it doesn't sit out in space. And yet these are the things that effectively help us see the visual world around us. So from the point of view, of a photon that is hitting your retina now, there is no difference between the point of time it hits your retina from the point of time it was created around about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. As far as it is concerned, it is exactly the same moment. Now, what does this say about the universe? Because if time is relative and everything that we see around us is, is relative, what does this say about how our visual systems work. Because we've got this weird little object, whatever it is, that's a wave or a particle, depending upon whether it's observed or not. We can't even go there because that gets so sodding weird, it's untrue. <laughs> that when a photon, for instance, when you look out of a window, you think you are seeing the light coming through the window and that you're seeing an image from outside. You are not. What happens is, Photons hit other photons and they transfer the energy from one photon to another. So the actual information that's been carried by the photon is not the original information. It's transferred. It's copied, as it were. 
So you have been a bizarre situation that your visual world is created by objects that just don't seem to have any kind of real existence in the way we believe. Now then there's the counter argument to say, if the act of observation brings into existence the photon, your visual world is being created by you hmm. because you're collapsing the wave function just very quickly. A photon, any subatomic particle, but specifically a photon, before it's observed or measured, is what is in a probability wave. It is a wave of probabilities. It's not even a wave in the way we understand it, like a, a, a water wave. Max Born came up with this idea. Max Born, fascinatingly enough, is a bit of an aside. Max Born was the great, great grandfather of Olivia Newton John. The guy who came up with this idea was the great grandfather of Olivia Newton John. That's another bit of nonsensical information I have stuck in my head somewhere. But Born came up with the, the idea, well, not the idea, but it's been subsequently proven, that it's a probability wave. It's like a crime wave. It's not like a wave in water. It's like a crime wave. And depending upon what you're looking for will depend on where, say, it's a, a photon inside of boxes. And it can be anywhere inside that box. In fact, it can be anywhere in the universe. That photon can be anywhere in the universe. Probability is it's likely to be in the box, for instance. But there's an infinitely tiny, small probability it could be the other side of the Andromeda galaxy. You observe the thing, or you measure it, and then you observe it, and it becomes a point particle coming into your eye. But before it comes into your eye, it's nowhere. It's not only nowhere in space or nowhere in time. It's nowhere anywhere. It's not anywhere. It is no thing. Okay? But this is how we see the visual world. And this is what excites me. This is all a grand illusion. This is, if the, if the quantum physicists were really putting together the implications of the things they write and they understand and they discover. Now, again, um, for instance, the argument that's been used many times in terms of quantum physics is, you know, don't even think about the philosophy of it. Just measure it. Just, just work on it. E.E. Uh, e. Rabi was, I was E.E. Rabi, I can't remember which one it was now, but somebody said, you know, just measure things and just do the measurement. And in, in fact, the, the, the father of quantum physics, Niels Bohr, the guy who came up with the Copenhagen interpretation in 1926, 27, he said that you cannot even, you cannot even think about subatomic particles in any way. All we know is the effects they have because they're so totally alien, there's no point in even trying to understand them. And this is why Einstein had such problems. This is why Erwin Schrodinger had such problems and why Schrodinger's cat's experiment came up. Because Bohr and co said, if you're not looking at something, it doesn't exist. And there was a very famous Einstein quote where he said, I cannot believe that the moon does not exist if I'm not looking at it. But in 1981, at the Paris um, University Department of Optics, Guys called Dalabard and Alan Aspey did an experiment which proved something called um, uh, uh, the um, Bell's inequality, which was written in 1966 by an, uh, an Irish uh, quantum physicist, which effectively proved that subatomic particles do work this way. And this is where suddenly we then have this thing of entanglement. So the universe is fascinating, but the universe exists because it is perceived. This is the ancient religious beliefs. Yeah. The universe is perception. Yeah. Well, sort of, yeah, because this is just absolutely mind-blowing, isn't it? I mean, amazing. Yeah. Again, you've just totally... I, mean, I don't know how you can recall all of this information. It's extraordinary. <coughs> um, I've got one more question before we move on to the book, so I, I know we do need to get on to the new book quite soon. Just but still on the nature of light, um, which is biophotons, because I first heard, read about biophotons in Jeremy Narby's um, uh, The Cosmic Serpent. And that amazed me that trees and uh, plants are giving off light, essentially, that, that they have created, which we receive, which is one reason why we love to be in nature, because we're picking up biophotons. But we're also creating biophotons within ourselves, it seems, because, and, I mean, something used to fascinate, what still fascinates me is, to, is when you have dreams or, or hallucinations or anything of that kind, you see them in full colour, and well, I do, and I think most people do, um, fully, fully illuminated. And same with imagination. When I'm writing books and you know, thinking about the novels, I'm, I'm there, I'm observing what's going on, and I'm seeing it. But even with your eyes closed, you're, you, you, can, you, know, you are seeing these things in great detail, strange they may be. So there's a source of illumination, which is, the, I guess, the biophoton. 
how do we create biophotons and how do they differ from photons if they differ if they differ one of the the most important and, sorry, say we need to be fairly brief on this so yeah. we can get one on of the most this. important writers in this field at the moment is a guy called Istvan Bokken and Istvan is uh, a PhD researcher he was based in in um, uh, Budapest, and I th now think he's based in America, and he's written a series of papers on biophotons and the way in which it seems that we even biophotons seem to come out of our eyes as if, you know, it's the old idea that we perceive the world by projecting outwards things that we use. I mean, uh, it's quite intriguing how this is the original idea they thought. But biophotons seem to be things that are created by biological systems. It's, it's kind of a form of electromagnetic energy that's given off by, by, by systems. Now again, if anybody's interested in, in the latest work that's been done, let's go, John Joe McFadden, who is um, a professor of um, molecular biology at the University of Surrey, a guy that works very closely with Jim Al-Khalili, and uh, McFadden and Al-Khalili have written a series of books together about the, the uh, about biophotons and about biology and the way in which biology works under quantum physics effects. And again, it is all to do with electromagnetic energy and how electromagnetic energy is, is transferred and given off. Now, your point, I think, was a fascinating one. In hallucination circumstances, whether it's facilitated by diamethyltryptamine, by 5-MeO-DMT, by whatever, or just a dream sequence, there are shadows. Everything around you is illuminated. You see colors. As you rightly say, where are these colors being generated from? Where is this three-dimensional reality? And if it is the case that this external reality that people go to when they take entheogens, such as 5-MeO and, and DMT, if it is a reality that is just as real as this, again, where is the light source for that? Mm. If it's being just generated by your mind, the light source has to be somewhere. And these, again, are biophotons. So it seems that it's, it's photons and light that seems to be the the basis of everything and the basis of everything we see and believe. But going back to my point before, but biophotons, but photons, baby, biophotons or any form of photons, we don't even know what they are. We haven't got an idea. We haven't got a clue. But then again, we don't know what, we don't know what electricity is. It's amazing. We are amazing. We don't realize it most of the time, but it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, uh, being alive. I remember hitch, uh, hiking in last year in uh, southeast England. I went to the grave of your namesake, um, Mervyn Peake, uh, in a churchyard in a little village in East Sussex, I think. Um, wow. uh, inscribed on his gravestone is uh, is the words, um, to live at all is miracle enough, which I think kind of says it all, because it really, wow. is, it really is extraordinary. Uh, when we can appreciate it, it's absolutely extraordinary being alive in this yeah. universe absolutely extraordinary wonderful stuff let's move on let's get to the, the new book which is again it's extraordinary there's so much you've crammed into it um you know it, it really impresses me about how you can bring all these these facts together um the book essentially is about although i'm very impressed by the fact that you begin it and you end it with a very firm basis in science which i think is one thing that um distinguishes you from a lot of uh, well other uh, researchers and writers who, who can go off into the light fantastic and, and they don't necessarily get get their work grounded in science and you, you always do um, but the book is about egregores essentially and I, I would suspect that a lot of people may not know what an egregore is so again if you can can you just enlighten us what what are egregores egregore is a term that I'm applying to effectively thought forms, things that can be created by consciousness and can somehow be brought into existence within the external consciousness field, within the field external to us. So for instance, when uh, I give an example of um, uh, a lady called Alexander Neal, who was um, a French Belgian traveler in the 19, 19, 1920s um, in, in Tibet. And her and a group of people um, actually created a tulpa. And a tulpa, again, is a thought form that actually is manifested in external space. And they worked on this and they developed this creature that was out there that they could all perceive and see. 
And this creature took the role of a, 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 um, a Buddhist monk initially, and they could control it. But then it started to build up its own personality and its own motivations, and it became quite malevolent. And eventually they had to um, destroy it. They had to unthink it and uncreate it. And a similar event took place in Toronto in the 1980s, I think it was, or maybe the like 1970s, when a group of researchers created via a Ouija board um, an entity and a spirit that had never existed in reality, but they gave it a personality, called it Philip, and uh, claimed and gave it a backstory that he was a, a young uh, Catholic nobleman that had fallen in love with a Protestant girl in the Jacobi Jacobean period and had lost all his money and committed suicide. <laughs> they started getting messages from this entity um, that they weren't creating. So again, it seems that the human mind seems to be able to create these, these, these beings or bring them into existence from somewhere else by thinking about them. Now, I then argue that the egregores, the egregore as a term uh, comes from ancient Greek. And this is where it becomes very intriguing because it's effectively a, a synonymous with the word of watchers. Mm. And if you start looking into the book of Enoch, particularly the book of Enoch from the, the Apocrypha, I don't know if it's apocryphal or I, the only, the only actual religion I know, Christian religion that actually incorporates the book of Enoch in is the, um, the, the uh, Ethiopian church, the kind of derivative of the Coptic Orthodox. And they incorporate this into it. And I was actually talking to a young postdoctoral research, uh, doctoral researcher on my presentation on this book a couple of days ago. And he was explaining to me about how this works. Now, again, the concept of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch are a group of entities that seem to come down from elsewhere and come down to Earth. Uh, and it was, again, they came down in Mount Hermon uh, in, um, I think it's in sort of Lebanon, that kind of area. Um, and they, they taught the ancient Sumerians certain things and techniques and way to do things. And again, it seems that these beings seem to use the human mind to manifest within this within this world now in the book i differentiate the two i call this world the kenoma again going back to the ancient uh, gnostic terminology the kenoma is the kind of simulation we exist within the pleroma is the reality behind the reality mm. that interfaces and overlaps and again if you go into shamanic tradition there's the the upper world and the lower world and this is overlapping world that I believe that individuals, when they go shamanic traveling, when they take DMT, when they take ayahuasca, they, they, they come across. And the egregore is the term that I'm really using now and pushing now to say, these are the entities that, I'm, that people have been encountering, call them the fae, call them the jinn, call them whatever you want. The, the alien entities, the alien intelligences that, that plague our dreams, plague our greatest fears, and seem to feed upon us as well. And they seem to feed upon fear. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I know from my own experiences with ayahuasca and, and psilocybin that the, the, these <coughs> are very real, but occupying uh, what is a, a dimension beyond our, our, you know, our, the material dimension that we normally inhabit. But you're saying about um, Alexandra, Graham Neal and others, they actually created a physical yeah. being? which I suspect a lot of people are going to be quite skeptical about that. I mean, well, the, th the thing is, you, you know, you, you have to be in a situation whereby you either take her word for it or not. Mm. Um, and that's the major issue, you know, with, with all these things, as I argue many, many times, you know, the plural of anecdote is not proof. And in order to genuinely believe something, you have to, you have to sort of see it for yourself. You have to, you have to, it has to be empirical to you. It has mm. to be from your experience. And once it's from your experience, you will genuinely believe it. Now, whether it is true or not, all I know is that these stories have been around since as long as records have began. And in fact, even further back. I mean, I give the example in the book, as you probably know, about the discovery um, in 2018 uh, in northern India, um, in, in Kanka State, where they actually found underneath two villages a series of caves. And when they got into the caves, the caves hadn't been open for 20,000 years. And inside the caves were cave drawings. And the cave drawings were drawings of alien greys, creatures with big black eyes, yeah. and 
a slit for a mouth and everything else as well. These, these, these images can be found, I mean, Graham Hancock talks about it when he was in the Junction Shelter in his book Supernatural, where he talks about his, uh, the paintings and the drawings he saw in, um, in the Drakensberg Mountains. He then, he then makes the link and says that you actually look at some of these, these cave paintings and you see them repeated. Pesh Merle in France has a, um, a, somebody called the Dying Man that again looks like these kind of alien creatures. Then you talk to young children who have do drawings of the entities that they seem to encounter in liminal states, semi-dream states. The creatures look the same. So there seems to be a consistency here mm. that scientifically you have to accept purely and simply because there's so many source materials. Source material is so wide and so deep and so geographically spread that there has to be something in it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, what, what you do, which again... It, there's so much detail in the book, but you do trace the history and the, the evolution of the, the, these egregorial forms from ancient you know, prehistoric times right through to the modern day. And, and, and it's as though they evolve. Well, it's something I wrote about in my novel, Citadel, as you know, that I included, where they evolve to the point that we can perceive them according to our, our ability to, to perceive, um, and according to our own evolution. And that seems to be a theme that runs through the... Through the the new book, The Hidden Universe. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I would say that I'm very much the um, uh, in agreement with C.D. Broad and Henri Bergson, who argued that the brain is an attenuator. The brain functions in order to take information out of the external experiential field so we can work within the simulation. Um, and this, this idea has actually been proven dramatically in, in recent experiments that have been done where they've been scanning the brain of individuals who are taking entheogen substances like DMT and everything else. I think it was still, I think it was psilocybin, the particular experiments in question. And they found that what psilocybin does is it dampens down certain parts of the brain. It doesn't, it doesn't make the brain more aware, it makes it less aware, it makes it less effective. Yeah. Which begs the question that it's the brain has to be less effective in order to experience these things, which means they're there all the time. It's just the brain is stopping us seeing them. And that is fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I guess that has to be the case for us to function in the, in the material, in the physical world, because if we were seeing, experiencing these things all the time, we would just not be able to function as human beings. Uh, well, that was exactly the point in my, my previous Watkins book, Opening the Doors of Perception. Because yeah. that's what I argue that you know that certain individuals under certain circumstances may they be either facilitated by entheogens or through migraine or through temporal lobe epilepsy or through schizophrenia or through Alzheimer's um, uh, and Savon syndrome. All these individuals perceive the world very differently to us neurotypicals, mm. and they do so because their doors of perception are being opened by certain neurochemicals in the brain or whatever is, is, is dampening down these abilities. And suddenly they see the world as, as William Blake said, you know, if the doors of if the, the doors of perception were cleansed, we see the universe as it really is infinite. Yeah. And this is effectively what these things are doing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, more than interesting, absolutely fascinating. Um, we're getting close, I think, to running out of time. Are we all right, dear? I think that we're fine. And I just want to add a little comment, Anthony and Martin, this also happens in mediumship and in yeah. trance. When shamans bring down a particular deity, the same thing goes, the brain leaves and it's exactly what you're speaking about. Yeah, indeed, indeed. You know, the, 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 the phenomenon is universal, you know, and the more examples, and if you start applying my hypothesis or my ideas, you'll find it can explain and if, indeed, if somebody reads all my books, and it's going to sound incredibly vain here, but I think a reading of all my books, there is nothing that people do not have in, in extraordinary states of consciousness that my hypothesis cannot explain. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I, I would, I would support that from everything I've read of yours. Yeah, I mean, it, they are extraordinary books. Let's just uh, get back to... Um, the uh, um, the hidden universe, and you write to, towards the end. I mean, there's so much in there, as I said, and we can't cover it all, or, or even a fraction of it, really. Um, but you have some. Well, it's again about. I want to get onto the idea of the um, universe as a as a 
a simulation or, or possibly a projection more than a simulation. I'm not, I'm, I'm unclear on this, but from uh, the, but also you, you write a lot towards the end. And, and in the end, you, you, towards the end, you do say, please read this section carefully, which is good advice because it's, there's so much in there to think about. And I'm going to have to go back through it and really try and absorb it again. But you talk a lot you, you, uh, there about binary information, information um, the theories of John Wheeler and um, the nature of external reality, and also um, DNA and data storage. And that's another really fascinating thought, uh, idea. So I'd like to unleash you once again on that and just uh, fill us in on, on, on that topic. Yeah, it's recently been, comparatively recently been discovered that DNA can actually hold information now, you, 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 many of you may be aware that DNA is a code, and it has things called codons, and these are these are, these are, these are a, a, a mixtures of different kinds of um, I don't know what we call them actually. Uh, I suppose uh, well, I don't know exactly what we call them, but they they they're, they're very much there's a code in there, um, and the code can be used in such a way that you can you can encode within it information. And the information hold that, that DNA can hold is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Mm. We're talking about vast amounts of information. So when we are looking at our DNA at the moment, we are, we are missing a point. The DNA itself seems to have a depth of it that is bordering on strange. Now, you will recall that Richard Dawkins, who I cited earlier on, you know, his, his book, The Selfish Gene, one of the arguments he uses in that book is that we are, we are literally vessels of, of, of DNA. It's, we, are, we are the things that allow DNA to be immortal. We have this idea that we are in some way um, important. Hmm. But in fact, we're just tools by which DNA as a parasite carries itself through time. Now, could it be that DNA itself is, is the root of all of us? that it is DNA. And I, we know from, you know, the cosmic serpent, and you mentioned Jeremy Narby earlier on, and Narby's ideas on this. Yeah. His argument is that when you are in, um, in, in uh, ayahuasca facilitated or dimethyltryptamine facilitated altered states of consciousness, and I know this from the, the dreams that the uh, Lucia device stimulated in me, that I was dreaming after I had my inter interview, my first instance with uh, the Lucia, that, I was seeing snakes. Now again, you know, the twin, the concept of the twin snakes, it's the DNA strand. It's communicating with us. It's telling us the in plain plan. sight, this is what's going on. Yeah. Now yeah. again, DNA, we know that DNA, there's elements of DNA that seems to work using holographic principles. And what are holograms? They use light. So mm. we're coming back again to electromagnetic energy. We're coming back again to this kind of incredibly complex embedded i'm reminded here of the writings of, of david bow and his implicate and explicate orders the yeah. idea that we are we are coming out of an implicate order which which is perceived by our brains as the explicate order but it's like a hologram and we know that for instance a hologram that you break a holographic image apart you don't get a bit of the total image you get a denuded image of the total picture so everything is encoded in itself. Everything is wrapped inside itself. And I sometimes feel that when I'm doing my writing, I feel that I'm touching so close on the ultimate answer to everything. And then I just can't quite put it together. And I, you know, it drives me crazy because sometimes I'll go, I'm almost there. I've almost cracked it. Yeah. But the question is, if I or somebody else crack this, We've cracked the matrix. We've broken the matrix. We've broken the system. And is this why Archons don't allow this show to go on sometimes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but is it? Can we really crack the? Can we find the ultimate answer? Because whatever the, the ultimate answer to the ultimate <laughs> question is, it 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 then poses. You know, it's like deep, deeper questions. It's the, the it's the Nietzschean abyss, isn't it? It's the Nietzschean. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's the idea. It's the idea. It's the idea, Martin, isn't it? That if if this is a simulation, you then have to ask your question, the question: Who's created the simulation, and are they within a simulation? Which is um, the question we were all asking as children. If God made you know, yeah. like, the Christian environment, it's like 
if God made me and God made the universe, who made God? And it's the same it's question. The, it's the infinite regress, isn't it? But then again, if we, if we turn that on its head and say that, that somehow the whole of the universe, as they've discovered recently, you know, the universe is not flat. It does seem to be curved. If it's curved, it's a huge bloody sphere. And it means that you start at one point, you're going to end back at the same point again. But time and space are also enclosed within this huge sphere, which means you can come back on yourself in terms of time as well. You know, the Poncare, Poncare's recurrence, which is what Nietzsche based his whole thing on, was the mathematics of Poncare and the idea that, you know, that everything will come back on itself. Given time is what the Stoics believed. And I get so excited. And the only thing that frustrates the life out of me is that with the best will in the world, I have probably another 10 years before my brain gives out and I can't write anymore if I'm lucky. But I have in that 10 years, I've got so much I have to do. I've got so many ideas, so many things buzzing around in this stupid head of mine. And all I want to do is get them out there hmm. and, and get them written down before I can't do it anymore. And that's not me being vain. You know me. I'm not vain at all. It's, I'm not that special. But what I, what I do like doing is joining dots. And that's why our extended group are so important. Hmm. You know, the, we are building an egregore now, the egregore of our collective consciousness when we meet. Yeah. And the power yeah. of the ideas we throw out. Yeah, we've got met some fascinating people in the last few years that we've, we've got together with. There's uh, just one other thing I just wanted to come back to, which you, it's, it's in the prologue of the book, um, which is something I knew, but when I, you, 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 described it so eloquently that it kind of blew my mind once again, which is the fact that we are essentially, and all matter is, is essentially 99.9999999% empty space, although there's no real such thing as empty space. Um, and you use this analogy of a sugar cube, which I kind of thought was, was really quite elegant. So I wonder if you could just explain that. It's just the idea that if you took all the empty space out of everything or the whole of humanity the whole of humanity could sit could fit in a sugar cube and that's a, an incredibly mind-blowing concept but it <laughs> but it gets weirder than that because the actual solid matter that we talk about even there are actually made of quarks and quarks again are point particles so the, the physical building blocks of matter you know, your, um, your electrons and, and your, your protons and your neutrons are actually made up of, 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 of a number of quarks. You know, an up quark, a down quark, you know, and a, a charm and a, whatever the others are. And these just come together to create these things. But then it, they in turn are like photons, they're point particles. Mm -hmm. So even the matter that is supposedly there starts to disappear. And the whole thing seems to disappear in a puff of logic. Yeah, um, just, look, a point you made there is that we, we actually never really make physical contact with the physical world because it's all electromagnetic energy. And when we feel we're, we're touching something solid, we can feel it. We can, I've just hurt my arm doing that. And we can, but we're not actually contacting physical matter. No, it's electro, electrostatic uh, uh, um, repulsion. The idea is the outer, the outer shell of every atom reacts with the outer shell of the atoms in your finger and you never physically touch because they repulse each other. And it's the same with everything. The reason that your hand does not go through the table, you don't fall through the floor or you don't fall through your chair is literally because of this. It's not because you're in contact with anything. We don't contact anything. We don't contact anything in the physical world outside. And also what we see is actually encoded a message within photons. You don't see the universe, you don't see the world around you. What you see is the impact and the information carried within a photon or a series of photons, which is carrying information from things it's bounced off. You know, it's mind blowing. It's it really is. I was thinking, I mean, for example, going back to the 99 blah, 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 percent empty space, the, the, when you're feel, I mean, imagine you're making love to your favorite person. You're having all these wonderful sensations, but actually they're not physical sensations. They're just impulses of electromagnetic or electrostatic energy. And if you took all that space out of this 
beautiful person that you're with and reduce them to their physical components, they would probably be something like one billionth the size of a grain, yeah. single grain of sugar, which is and then you get a another perspective on things. <laughs> and then you get to the final mystery, don't you, of qualia. You know, the idea that, that everything I perceive is, is being reproduced and recreated by my brain as a perception but it's not actually physically out there. My brain creates it for me. Um, so suddenly, you know, even the sensation of the feeling, and if we can be crude about this, you know, the, the sensation of an orgasm, it's, it's a feeling, it's a qualia. It doesn't, that sensation, if, if there were no animals in the universe or creatures in the universe that were sentient, the concept of the orgasm wouldn't exist, but neither would the color red neither would pain. All these things evaporate because they don't exist in the external world. They're not there. They are only there because they are being perceived by somebody. It's the perception of these things. And the perceiver themselves, consciousness, how does consciousness get in the brain? Where is consciousness in the brain? How does consciousness work? Billion dollar question. <clears throat> you know, the hard problem of science. And these are all the questions I demand answers for. I'm not going to take the label science whereby we call something hallucination and we label it. You know, it came up in a TV com uh, program I was watching last night where somebody explained something by saying it was a placebo. They have no idea what the placebo effect is. Just like they have no idea what science is. We know what things do, but we don't know how they do them. Mm. Mm. We have no idea. Yeah, again, it's just, it's just, baffling because we are consciousness trying to explain itself and that's uh, that in itself is a paradox because we we don't know what we are and we're trying to find out what we are but we're investigating ourselves in order to find out what we are which leads us kind of it gives the impression that also it's another point which i know i discussed briefly with you some time ago but the more we discover and whether it's about the external universe it gets vaster and vaster whether it's about the quantum universe which gets vaster and vaster the smaller you get the more there is to discover you know, there was no we thought we had the basic building block in the atom years ago and then we discovered electrons and protons and a nucleus and then it gets into the subatomic world and it seems to get there's more and more to discover and the same with, with the the inner world of the you know if you're you're examining the the, the, the world of the psyche and the, the collective unconscious it just gets vaster and vaster. It's like the mystery extends itself the more we look into it. And again, that leads back to, can we ever really discover the ultimate answer? It's just a, a bloody big Mandelbrot set. <laughs> you know? And, you know, the more we drill, it, 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 it just gets more and more complex, more and more wonderful. Mm. You know? And the thing is, the thing I've discovered is, um, to quote Socrates, I think it was, the more I know... I'm aware of the less I know. Yeah, and absolutely. people who are so assured that they know they're right, I, I find those people breathtaking because I haven't got a clue of what is going on. I'm, I'm, I'm not even at 0.01% of understanding what's going on. And future generations will look back on us and say, arrogant twats, you know, they, they thought they knew everything. They, they knew nothing. Yeah. We, we don't. Exactly, yeah. We're just... We just we don't. But I think that, that probably where well, we should leave it, I think. But it's Are we at the end? I think, yeah. I, well, I just want to say again, um, for anybody out there who's, who's interested, this is an amazing book, yet another amazing book. And I re highly recommend it to, to anybody who has the remotest interest in what we've just been talking about. It's a fantastic achievement by you. So, um, you know, thanks again for, for, for producing it. And um, it's been a fascinating chat and i wish you great success with the new book and um thank you dear for producing this for us and um i don't know if you want to sign off i'll take a back seat now i don't know if you want to talk about what's coming up in later editions of yeah. consciousness now but thanks very much for a very fascinating chat and phil uh, you know, martin just just to say that it's so important that people actually check out your books thank you because your books um, they will but yeah uh, I'm glad. I'm very, very pleased that you, you've enjoyed them. Guys, I read six of Martin's books, one of his series, Enchantment Reach, and I read one after the other because I literally couldn't put them down. 
these books are extraordinary. And if you like, if you think Game of Thrones is, is, is anything, this is nothing to the depth that Martin goes into in his novels. They, they, there are so many different levels, there's so many ideas. And I know he's got lots of other books as well, you know, The Chronicles of the Shaman, which I've read one of those as well, which blow my mind as well. So check out his work, it really is, really is extraordinary. Um, and yes, in terms of, um, we have now, I think around about eight or nine people that are now booked in for next year. We have a whole series of fascinating people that will be joining us, uh, which I'll be placing up on, um, on Facebook, uh, on uh, my website. Um, also, as a final point, if anybody's interested, please, please, please check me out also on Instagram. I'm quite active on Instagram now, and my Instagram is cheatferryman 54 um, So join in there. I need to get a 1,000 people following me. I've only been on there for about six or seven weeks. But if I can get a 1,000 people on there, I can actually then post URL links as well to things like this. So I think it's quite important. But thanks again. And as Martin said, thanks again to Dia Nunez over there in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, who without this, this wouldn't happen. Okay, thanks very much. And again, thanks, Martin. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.